Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Connection with the Weekly Comic Book Roundup. I'm going to get things started with this week's X books as well as this week's, well, miscellaneous Marvel books. Starting with Marauders number 15. Where we left off in, if I remember correctly, Marauders number, yes, actually it was Marauders number, Marauders number 14. Wolverine attacked and seemingly ran through Saturnine at dinner. So the, begin, the, the issue begins with two quotes. First, for, well, the first one from Sun Tzu in The Art of War. Every battle is won or lost before it is ever fought. That's just from the white, sword of the, the white Sword of the Celestial Spire. You cannot be humbled in war if you never taste death. After Logan murdered Saturnine in her own home, chaos erupted. A fierce three-way battle between the forces of Saturnine, Krakoa, and Arako sent the Starlight Citadel plummeting from the clouds. Magic managed to teleport the Krakoans home as the cacophony of the palace shattering below reverberated in their ears. With the external gate closed, our arguments began anew in the Quiet Castle about what, if anything, was owed to Otherworld. It was a short row as the external gate ruptured with the full fury of battle heart of battle-hardened Iraqi warriors. They had already fought Ameth to, brought Ameth to heal, and now the campaign for Earth had commenced on Krakoa. For three days and nights, the mutants waged war upon each other. The Iraqi were reinforced constantly from the gate, but the Krakoans did not have their number. Tens of thousands of mutants were slaughtered before a call for help was made. A telepathic mind bomb was hauled through the gate and detonated. Hundreds of mutants' higher brain functions were erased from their brains, including Moira X in her no place. Krakoa issued a distress call that was answered by the Earth's Mightiest Heroes, the Avengers of Fantastic Four and the hosts of Asgard, who all fought and lost. The mountains of corpses from the waters around Krakoa red, and as the island burned alive, one mutant witnessed the end of the dream. One mutant watched as Apocalypse was decapitated, drawn, and quartered. The Wolverine saw it all with deathless eyes. And so we see New York burning, um... As uh, Doctor Strange is uh, violently ejected from the Sanctum Sanctorum by by War and one of the other horsemen. On Krakoa, Wolverine is once again crucified on an X, much like the Reavers did to him in the Outback. And he's stabbed. As a, from behind, his woman asks him what the final fate of Krakoa's deathless man is. Turns out, the woman asking is in fact Saturnine. She who admits after stabbing Logan. Stabbing is kind of fun. But she she does explain that um, Logan's head will never wear a crown, but he knows that he but she knows he cares deeply for his people, and so despite the harm he intended her, Saturnine freely gives him this the, a gift. A gl glimpse of the future. What happens should Wolverine fail his people? And quickly Wolverine comes to back in the, in the Hall of Fallen Banners. And Saturn suggests that, she, that he sit down before his food gets cold or he, she will banish him to a lifeless realm. As he sits back down, Cypher reaches over, stating he doesn't, stating he didn't think Logan would mind if he batted clean up on his uh, sushi appetizer. It is quite exquisite. Logan sits down and says, that's fine. He smells something. Tries to get uh, Cypher to stop eating. And realizes someone poisoned his appetizer. As Cypher died, begins to asphyxiate, Iska the Unbeaten comes in and opens his airway. 
the white sword goes after war for this. And her defense is simply that it should have been the Wolverine. As far, there is far too much to say to let their face be decided by the crossing of swords and the monster is their great impediment. The white sword uh, calls poison the weapon of the craven. And also called, he will not be part of your cowardice. And it's also adding to the reason that the tower ever fell as he heals Doug. As he heals Cypher. Stating that Cypher of Krakoa, Cypher, Sword of Krakoa is whole and released from any obligation to the White Sword. Apocalypse and Genesis sit across from one another and Apocalypse simply says, I see you did well with the children. Genesis states that she did her best. Uh, Captain Avalon goes to speak to uh, Saturnine while uh, various other conversations take place, including um, Storm making a threat to Jim Jaspers of the to uh, Jim Jalpers of Crooked Market. Um, Pogger Pog being well Pog or Pog and so on and so forth. But uh and, and Captain Avalon, Brian Braddock, suggests that as the Iraqi have violated the invitation and sought to win by cheating, he requests that uh, she set aside their claim, declare Trek over the winner by forfeits, and the Iraqi on their way. Saturnine says that there is fairness in, in the suggestion, and she and she would move to vacate their claim. However, the Krakowans also sought to commit murder this evening and attempted to slay her. Brian knows exactly to whom she, she refers and simply says, damn that pig-headed dwarf. Apparently, the fact that he was considering this impressed war. War didn't even consider an atta attack on the Majestrix. He just explained, and he simply explained he wants to get, get people home safe. War understands that, you know, no, it's a singular desire of every brave soldier. The next course is then served. Scarabs stuffed with the hearts of Polonais from the rivers of Wahhabi, cooked to perfection in reduction of the greatest wines from Sebalith. Death is not pleased with this, as, um... Beetle the scarab. The, the, the scarab is sacred to him. And the service means that he didn't see any vegetarian requests, and apparently, this being after death has removed his helm and killed the server. While death was taking care of the server, Wolverine took the scarab. Apparently, you can't let good food go to waste. Brian explains that he didn't... He, he had no idea what... Brian explains to uh, Saturn that he had no idea what Logan's intention was, and she... And Saturn believes him. And, and it is sorry that she can't grant his requests. But perhaps some accommodations could be made if he, he were to lift the right sword and reclaim the mantle he was destined for. Basically, become Captain Britain again. He states that that... He asks that she forgive him, explaining that that is his past.
And then he tells her he trusts that she won't go to bits. And she claims that she, that she won't. And the main course has been brought out. The horned beast is actually... Unicorns. Ah. The white sword gate looks upon this and claims that he never eats for his beyond hunger. But for the great unicorn, he will make an exception. Storm is very, very much against eating a unicorn. Wolverine's already dug in, saying that it's not only is it good, it's damn, damn good. Summoner explains that he's never seen the White Sword snatch her soul from death and fail to conscript them into his army. Though the White Sword does explain that he's never been asked to carry the shame of a poisoning in a parlay. Summoner adds that, he, that Cypher doesn't know how lucky he is. It's one thing to die, it's another thing to be eternal fodder for the, ba the, the battles of the White Sword. Though... The white sword says, lifting a sword is a small price for eternal life. Summoner explains that he doesn't plan to die for a long time, but he only intends to do it once. Gorgon explains that nothing, nothing truly bores him more than listening to others plan for their eventual deaths, and then asks if uh, the white sword would be able to resurrect himself. The white sword actually has no idea, and he'll never know. Cable, who has been seated next to Apocalypse, because that just was a great idea, I'm sure, tries to break the ice with between him and Genesis, and kind of just explains that uh, this, this this has to be weird for them. Apocalypse actually try, tries to be, you know, polite to uh, the boys, explaining that weird is a human word, uses as a reality that, that uh, human minds fail to grasp. And he'll understand that in time, when he has more experience. Uh, there's also an opening line from James, uh, James Jasper's uh, All of Survival Calculated by, in, the, uh, in the tournament. Um, at dessert, Domino, or Cable goes to talk to Iska, and brings up the whole thing that she's unbeaten and he wants he wants to see it she simply says that uh he will witness her power tomorrow magic explains that uh you know she's got some ideas on what well, to do pin the tail on pogger pog i guess also pin the tail on logan um Cutting the stem, cutting the stemware just right so that it doesn't immediately fall. Also, just nicking uh, Cable's thumb, and finally a uh, something akin to uh, three card Monty. and Magic said. Said, as imagine what happened if uh, Iska fought Domino, and Iska simply says your friend would lose. Cable explains that he's not looking forward to fighting her. Though Iska says that uh, he may live to a ripe old age after all. Death and Red River watching. Death saying the enemy, or, their enemies are so weak and soft, but Red Root explains that. The, his death's words ring true, true on the wind, but Red Root looks at them and wonders. Perhaps they were grown on a better world than theirs. If the mutants of Morocco had set Root on Krakoa instead, they would have grown on the sun. Death insists that Red Root set aside such thoughts, tells not to attach himself to these weak things. They will be called come the dawn.
Wolverine tells Storm of, of the vision that uh, Saturnine gave him. Added that they have better of a plan if the score isn't in their favor. And then Saturnine names the first two contestants for the next day. Bessie Braddock, Captain Britain, against Iska, the unbeaten of Arako, to the death. And that is where the issue ends. Which, of course, brings us to our next selection of the week, Excalibur number 14, part 15 of Ten of Swords. We begin, you should begin with a quote from Apocalypse. Find the most fearsome challenger in all of creation, make her your wife. Lie down at night next beside your greatest threat. Make love to your fate. I like it. So the issue begins with at the Forgiven Forest Encampment in Avalon. Betsy's contacted Jubilee and is explaining what's going on to her. But isn't able to explain much as Iska has come to speak to uh, Betsy and actually suggests that uh, Having her having found out the the card that uh, was delivered to Betsy being was nine of swords is an ill omen. But uh, she and she tries to give some friendly advice. You know, basically, hey, you know, you could you can forfeit to avoid a, to avoid death. And so, King Jamie of uh, Avalon has the duel be as the, the contest begin, and so, uh, Betsy actually somewhat impresses it, Iska. with. Uh, Betsy explain, explaining that if uh, Iska can't lose, then all that means is that, she, that Iska never learned how to fight. And then Mercy, Iska swings Mercy at the, the Crystalline Sword, at the Starlight Sword. And not only does the sword shatter, but Betsy as well. Which does definitely uh, shed some light on what was stated about Saturnine not falling, not being the one to fall to bits. Also, Brian, Captain, Captain Avalon, he's clearly aware that yes, this was somehow this was at this was somehow. Saturn I meddled in this portion of the contest. Next. The next challenge is to be between Doug and Bay the Blood Moon, as both are led away by attendants. But for some reason, Cypher can't understand a single word that Bay the Blood Moon is saying. Bear in mind, Cypher's mutant power is the ability to understand all language. So, the, the attendants are place a crown of flowers on Cypher as well as a toga when magic shows up talking to him because 
They don't, she has no idea what's going on. Um, but it doesn't, it power doesn't look like another duel. They brought a cake. So, which leads Doug to think, to think maybe Bay's going to hunt him for sport and, and serve him. Him. Or she's or he's going to serve her. But Leon doesn't really think that's the case. After all, they brought a cake. Turns out though Doug is to marry Bay. And um <laughs> Ileana simply asks if he needs to talk, adding that she's all self-taught, but she'll do her best. But he says, no, 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 he can do this. Um, but Saturday night instructs Doug to decide for to, you know, repeat his vows, and so, he, but he, since he didn't realize he was getting married, he didn't write vows, but he does come up with some good ones, so, <clears throat> Bay the Blood Moon, this is a little bit absurd, because I don't know anything about you, but you're going to be my wife, so I, I swear to uphold my vow to you for the duration of this challenge, or, or whatever, and I'll always be grateful that we got to do this instead of storage, right, because I'm not re ready to die. And then, so, Bay turns around with, his, with her own vows. When the grim fog of bloodshed overtakes us, the beloved is the beacon that returns us to our better selves. Love is a fealty that cannot be broken. I will love you with the force of the wave that crashes the shore and fight for you like the current that swallows the sand. And Cypher has to ask, basically ask, if everyone else can understand her, and Apocalypse simply assures him that Bay's vows are good vows, and that he should accept them. And so, just as about to, just as the, just as uh, Cypher gets to kiss his bride, Jubilee shows up on Shogo, and uh, yeah. So, Storm goes to calm her down. Goes, hey, look, this is not... We really need you to not be here right now. But, uh... Bay the Blood Moon puts her uh, helm back on and gets, get, gets her blade ready and um, Cypher asks not, you know, basically, you know, please don't go after the dragon, you know, you know, please don't hurt the dragon. And she kisses him again. But Saturnine manages to manipulate Shogo. Um, and basically take control of Shogo. So now the Queen of Other World has her own dragon. And the end score is Arako 2, with the first duel, where Iska's, Iska and Captain Britain's duel having been a victory for Arako. Krakoa 1, as both are given a victory point. And so then, it suggested that they cut cake. And that is where the issue ends, which brings us to our next Chapter and Ten of Swords. In 
Wolverine number seven. Previously, for Wolverine's portion of for the Wolverine portion of this, Wolverine went to Japan to find Muramasa, which led which caused him to have to go in, into hell. Also in hell was the uh, Iraqi Solom. Turns out both were supposed to attain Muramasa blades. And they did. And Muramasa himself ended up dying. So the issue begins with a quote from Saturnine. So many cards left in the deck, and we've only just begun to deal hands for the game. So we begin um, with... Uh, Magic's duel against Pogger Pog. It's looking like it, and so of course, Magic draws her blade. But however, as does Pogger Pog. However, Saturn explains it. This is not a contest. You know, this is not a contest of swords, but a contest of arms. It's an arm wrestling contest, which Pogger Pog easily wins. Elsewhere, in Blight spoke. Wolverine must fight Summoner while in telepathic contact with Saturnine. And so they duel it out through varying uh, and all, constantly alternating uh, realities, including a point where it looks like they're almost pulled right out of Tron. This one right here. Nice little touch. I remember years ago. It was actually, I think it was when the, uh, I think it was when Tron Legacy came out. There was a series of Tron-inspired variant covers, and oh, I wish I had got my hands on all those. There is also a write-up on the Battle of Blight Spoke, um, and what happens there. But when all is said and done, the Muramasa blade is. Wolverine's Muramasa sword is jammed into Summoner's face. And while Wolverine tr claims, hey, you know, he won, so look, get me out of here. Saturnine states that it was a fight to the death. Summoner fought to the death. So the point goes to Araka. Which, I'm just straight to say, it, that's bullshit. Next, we join Saturday Night and Jim Jaspers in uh, a bar in the Crooked Market. Apparently, he's having a drinking contest. The Page of Cups is drawn. And so, Wolverine and Storm ha are to have a drinking contest. But, uh, and Storm does, uh, add that in the crooked market there's always a cost. Just a, it'll just be a matter of time until they figure out what's owed. Meanwhile, Jim has slipped out and met quietly with death and gotten a, uh, scarab shaped bottle for something. Elsewhere, Solomon War are about to fight it out while Wolverine and Storm drink it out. With Solom explaining that, uh, you know, this is very exciting. War, a bereaved widow, is offered the opportunity to avenge her lost husband. But, he states that he has other plans. And just as Wolverine and Storm are about to kiss in the bar, Wolverine is teleported to the arena where Solomon and War are fighting.
And Wolverine realizes that there, that must have been some pretty strong booze he was drinking if it's still affecting him. And the Three of Swords is drawn. And Solomon explains to War just what it, or what happened in the in the fight between Wolverines, or who, who it was that fought Summoner, and how that fight ended. And so, Saturnine simply says, says that the first of seven appendage wins. And so, Wolverine and Ward duke it out. And uh, suffice to say, there's nothing quite like the fury of a mother grieving her child. And so, the, they, the, so, Sol, or, so, War and Wolverine duke it out. With... Saturnine adding that uh, just as there, there's a cost of everything at the crooked market, there's a cost of trying to kill her. And he and she does mention that something is going to happen to Storm as well. However, as the fight continues, War's hand is cut off by Solom, and so uh, the Araco is. Given, given the point. And that is where the issue ends. Presumably we'll actually get it, we'll see a more of a conclusion to this battle. Which brings us to our next comic of the week, Champions, number two. Continuing the Outlawed story arc. Um, so, Outlawed. Um, a quick version. Civil War. Kids versus adults. A the champions were trying to protect a an important uh, a VIP uh, at a school. There was an explosion. Miss Marvel, Kamala Khan, was injured, and it, while unconscious, a law was passed in her name that basically forced all teenage all superheroes under the age of 21 to either register with Cradle or stop or, or become super criminals. Uh, they could train and they could, you know, have a an approved mentor, so to speak. Not all of the champions are in favor. In fact, most of the champions are not in favor of this. Um, a meeting of young heroes was uh, called together. However, it was, they were, someone betrayed them. And some of them got captured. Presumably, it was Vivision. Signs were pointing to the possibility that maybe Vision was somehow involved in the betrayal, or possibly even Vivision, though Vivision is supposed to be dead. And so we begin at a cradle re-education facility, the uh, four, a handful of ca a handful of captured uh, teenage superhumans were are being uh, an attempt is being made to re-educate them. Locust, Stogard, Bombshell, and Starling, with uh, the big main thing being. Responsibility being top, being with stories such as the deaths, of Vance Astrovic's accidental, the accidental killing of Vance Astrovic's father by Astrovic himself, as well as uh, Kevin Ford's accidental murder, accidentally killing his father when his mutation uh, manifested. Kevin Ford be, having been the mutant known as Wither. So you could take a guess what happened there. Um, two of the uh, captured heroes attempt to 
make a break for it, however. A cradle enforcer band time slip deploys what's referred to as the butterfly part protocol. Going back to the moment, moment before, uh, they transformed and took both of them out of there. No harm, no foul. So, technically, no one's supposed to notice, but the short range doesn't work that well. Oh, it doesn't always work that well. In Chicago, there's a protest. Based half in support of young superheroes, half against. Um, one of Miles' schoolmates, Jamila, is uh, who is present when uh, when the initial when everything began. She's actually in favor of this, of the law, of Kamala's law. Things get rough, and we find out that Miss Marvel, Nova, and Spider-Man, Miles Morales, are watching from a, on top of a roof, a building. Um, Nova, Spider-Man, and then well, Nova, Miss Marvel, and Spider-Man go down to help as things do get out of hand, and eventually they end up in the. Uh, they manage to shape, they seemingly manage, they try to shake uh, Pursuit and end up at the South Shore home of Rod Eye Williams, Ironheart. Um, and Kamala does kind of say, hey, someone ratted us out and got some of us captured, which, you know, maybe it was, uh, maybe it was Rai Rai. But Ironheart explains that, you know, when she had to face Viv, a person she cares about, make a decision to do something no one could kill her, Kamala wasn't there. Then it, it also comes up stating that, you know, Ironheart's identity is, a pu is public knowledge. You know. Nova's uh, congressional testimony was like Nova. Spider Miles was Spider Man. Hers, however, Fireheart's was Rari Williams. I mean, everyone wondered where Miss Marvel was, of course. And while it does seem she's against the whole cradle thing, at the same time. There's a whole thing of, you know, hey, yeah, you know. Much as they were gone, you know, and that the chain has been real naive about the risks of what they do, and the chickens have come home to roost. And Miles kind of agrees with her. Sam tries to talk to him, Sam tries to talk to her, you know, kind of bringing his own insecurity into things. But it turns out that, uh, Cradle, show, Cradle followed the three champions to uh, Rai Rai's home. And we learned that, yes, it was Viv, Viv, it was not Vision, but rather Viv Vision, presumed dead, who betrayed the champions in Champions number one. And so she gets on a bus, well, you know, young, traveling alone, while her former teammates duke it out with government agents in Chicago. That is where the issue ends. Which brings us to actually a comic I've been looking forward to for most of this year. Because... And I understand part of why it was uh, why it was delayed. It was put out to coincide with the release of a film, and well, that movie was supposed to come out a, a weekend uh, last weekend. But yeah, it's not going to come out till next year now. Taskmaster number one. So the issue begins. 
Um, we get some narration from Taskmaster. So I mean, you know, all in all, it's just it's work. Everyone's got to work. You got to eat. Got to put a roof over your head. Outfits don't come cheap. Throw some henchmen in the mix, and buddy, you can't afford to take it easy. So you do dirty deeds for dirtier dollars. Industrial espionage, muscle work, bodyguarding, murder. Hell, even lowest of the low. Golf. Turns out, someone's killed Maria Hill, though. And they and Taskmaster's shield, covered in blood, is that is at the scene. Taskmaster, however, has been to, is out on uh, is out at the fourth annual Magia Celebrity Doubles Charity Golf Tournament in New Jersey, as one of these celebrities. He's been paid to be a mob boss, a Magia boss's uh, partner, and the guy's not happy that Tasky showed up in in costume. Tasky explains though that you know. He's being paid for a win, not to sell out his professional identity. The outfit and the outfit is award-winning, best skull costume three years running, having beat out the Red Skull. But uh, his partner is going, you know, what's wrong with minimal? You know, let me look at Bullseye over there. And well, Tasman simply says, anyone can make black and white. And blue look good. It's a cop out. Lacks panache. Turns out though, Bullseye, Bullseye and his partner are losing, and well, Bullseye's asked, uh, you know, what he's being paid for, and he simply says, I, you know, he can't golf for the guy. So, <laughs> Taskmaster. Takes a moment to pick on Bullseye a little bit. Suggesting maybe he should just go back to killing Daredevil's girlfriends and leave this to the pros. And then, someone puts a bullet through the head of uh, Tatnus' partner and starts firing at the, at the greens. Apparently whoever it is is Definitely has a mat on for Taskmaster. So, he copies some of Ghost Rider's driving skills, grabs some arrows, a bow and some arrows, tries to copy some of Hawkeye's skills, but meanwhile, he gets a phone call. Someone knows what's going on and is, suggesting, and is trying to give him a way out. And so, he bear Taskmaster takes the way out because whoever is whoever trying to kill him is really good. The usual tricks ain't working, basically. And it turns out that the phone call was from none other than Nick Fury Jr. And he then Fury explains that uh, Maria Hill's been murdered. Apparently, no. So when Taskmaster asks, asks, you know, clearly not unfazed by this because who cares? It's Maria Hill. No, no one likes Maria Hill. He asks, "Who did it?" And Fury says, "You did." But no, no, he didn't. And with Fury explaining that, hey, your shield is on scene, but Fury knows that Taskmaster didn't do it. Mainly, he, and of course, it wasn't until Taskmaster sat down in the car that Fury knew this for sure, but after all, there's no way Maria Hill's murderer would be dumb enough to get into a car with Nick Fury Jr. Hill, after all, made him. Taught him everything, taught him everything, every dirty trick, every underhanded move. Though, uh, Taskmaster opines that he's probably the Fury is probably the only one who, who misses her. Every, seems everyone hated her, and Fury does admit that Hell made enemies like Frank Castle makes corpses. 
But a lot of people didn't like her, but they did respect her. But so hey, he Taskmaster figures that you know he, he's just gonna, you know he'll go, he'll lay low for a while till, blow, till everything blows over. But Galia, Magipore, somewhere they won't follow. And that's when the other shoe drops as to who it was that was after Taskmaster. Black Widow herself, Natasha Romanoff. And, yeah, um... Taskmaster. You know, the guy that can copy anyone's physical physical moves just by watching them. Yeah, he, um... Oh, yeah. That scares him. With Fury qualifying Natasha as being the greatest killer to walk the planet Earth. Better than Winter Soldier, better than Electria, and better than Taskmaster. And so he. Taskmaster does the classic begging, like, oh man, you gotta help me. And then he stops and is like, wait, why are you helping me? And Nick says maybe it's their long history together that has him predisposed to enjoy Taskmaster's company. Or maybe he has a use for Taskmaster. I'd say 10% one, 90% the other. Take your guess as to which, which, which is which. Um, also, it turns out that uh, Taskmaster's got sleep apnea. But he nods off in the, in the car and they wake up in uh, Connecticut. As Safe House of Furies. Um, turns out that uh, when Maria Hill was murdered, she was working on uh, something called the Rubicon Trigger, a system on some old hammer rank frames. It requires biometrics to get into, though. It's explained that the system is locked to the the, kin the kinesic signature, the gate and body language of three people. To access it, you need to get these three people in the same room at the same time, inputting within 30 seconds of each other. Impossible to replicate. Unless you're Taskmaster. And so, he's a and so he Fury asks, can you imitate the three people? Taskmaster thinks he can, but for something like this, video won't cut it. He'd have to observe them personally and up close. Which is something Fury was afraid of. And we learned just who the three people are. Phil Coulson, Okoye, and, and Amy Han, director of South Korea's NIS Tiger Division. Top spies from all around the world, surrounded by some of the most dangerous people to ever exist. Yeah, this is gonna be fun. And that is where the issue ends. So yeah, I, I, I really enjoy Taskmaster. Um, he's a character who, he, normally with like say Deadpool, I actually kind of like the idea of Deadpool being quasi heroic. With Taskmaster, I like the idea that ta he he can be written as a good guy and a, as a good guy and a bad guy, and it works either way. He can be done goofy, he can be done serious, and either way, it works. Anyway, on to our last title, uh, last book for the video. Marvel Zombies Resurrection, number four. Where we left off... Our heroes had uh, ended up... had found the Galactus Hive. And we were beginning to find out just what had happened to Franklin Richards. He had been bitten. During the initial attack. So we begin with a flashback. The Sanctum, Sanctorum. Um, present are Winter Soldier, Warlock, Moonstone, Viv Vision, Electro, uh, Miles Morales, and there's one other I can't place. I don't think it's Blade, but it, it, it could be. Spider Man shows up with Valeria and Franklin, needing help. 
begging for help. With Spidey bases, you know, you tell me that none of you can save a dying kid? And Warlock explains that with Doctor Strange's help, he can. But not the way he, that Peter wants him to, to help. Meanwhile, in the present, Valeria and Franklin have been seemingly reunited with their with their family. They're now zombified family. While Blade, Nanny, Logan, and uh, Spider Man are being held in a force field, and Mary Jane is talking to Spider Man, but uh, Invisible Woman takes a bite out of. Uh, Franklin and his technarch, his failings technarch nature is revealed. As he's explained, the Warlock made Franklin a new body from techno organic matter, and Doctor Strange transferred uh, Franklin's consciousness into the body before the old body died. It was the only way to save Franklin. And he's sorry, and Peter's sorry he never tell, told Franklin. And of course, so oh, the zombies are. Pissed. They're, they're going to rip him apart. And so Valeria, yeah, she she's just like, you know, I was hoping to find my folks, but no. And Valeria admits that they should have listened to, to Peter. Now they have to kill all the zombies. Meanwhile, Chewie coughs something up. A bunch of uh, Enos that were non-organics eaten at the uh, Phalanx Tower. Mary, J the zombified Mary Jane is trying to get uh, Spidey to, to, you know, join them. But yeah, no, he didn't have it. Meanwhile, Blade is just having the time of his life, killing zombies. Uh, magic comes along and slices up his, his cuts him up. All right, not terribly, but you know, destroys his glasses as well as the gun he's uh, using. Wolverine comes along and. Uh, Cuts off her head and says, you know, tell your brother I'm real sorry. Valeria explains that they have to get to the Galactus Hive. And Peter runs off saying that, you know, he, he loves MJ wherever she is. Uh, Nana's remain Nana flies towards the hive, uh, but things aren't uh, looking good for, for Nana. And Nana simply says that she's proud of both Franklin and Valeria before firing off her hands, her arms, and letting the zombies ha use the rest. Or, and using the, turn the rest into a, a, basically blowing up the rest to take out as much of the many of the zombies as possible. Inside the Galactus Hive, using the gauntlet that uh, Valeria has, she begins to charge things up. Franklin uses the Soul Sword to cut the Silver Surfer's board and stops Silver Surfer from messing with Valeria. And we find out that the gauntlet that uh, Forge built that Valeria uses uses the hand of a powerful mutant. Remy LeBeau. And so Franklin uses the uh, Soul Sword to make a portal, get every gets everyone out, Spider-Man, Blade, Chewie, Wolverine, and Valeria, as the hive explodes. A month later, Viv Vision and uh, Valeria rebuilding Nana. 
Um, Viv suggests they use they they could that they could salvage the necessary assets to construct fission, a fission reactor or fission reactor engines from the hangar bay, but it's explained that uh, Nana wouldn't want fi, won't want fission reactor engines because she'd have to vent outdoors every night. Viv suggests perhaps a solar nuclear hybrid engine, which that would be acceptable. Peter asks Logan what's next, and he was thinking, and Logan's thinking he might try and get the school up and running again. Blade is teaching uh, Franklin how to use the how to use a sword, or how to sword fight, I should say. Um, with uh, but Logan adds that he doesn't know what the world's gonna look like, but still has mutants, and they still need X Men. And uh, said asked what uh, what's next for for Peter, and he says he's thinking that thinking. Once they get Nana back online, Peter's thinking maybe he's going to try and get back in the hero game. You know, something that would keep, get him moving forward again. And the issue ends with uh, Franklin having uh, pulling the Silver Surfer's head out of the Soul Sword and top. He explains that he's found uh, books here, so that some of them written by Xavier. One, including one about the brood, and which says the brood always have a queen. So he has, as these zombies were initially brood, he asks, where's the, where's the queen? Surfer explains the queen is far beyond Franklin's reach. But he needn't worry. She knows who Franklin is, what he and the others have done, and the two of you will meet soon enough. And that is where the issue and the series ends. That's it for now. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, live long and rock hard.